pleasure to be here and uh, I spent some time talking uh, with Dr. Athar and uh, other folks at the school um, earlier today and you know a lot of the research went, that is being done on the at the program here is on a particular type of um, arsenic compound called lewisite, uh, which is a uh, notorious agent that was developed, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, as a chemical warfare agent. But um, arsenic in, in its inorganic form has been around for millennia and has a long and infamous history as a uh, chemical agent of poisoning. And I'm going to uh, also talk a lot today from a clinical standpoint about what it looks like when people get poisoned by arsenic. Uh, we're also going to talk about arsine gas, which is an unusual type of arsenic. We're going to come back to lewisite, and then we're going to uh, also talk a little bit about well, how, what has been done over the years to try to develop antidotes to these notorious poisons. Uh, you know, it's always interesting to get a historical perspective, especially when you're talking about uh, mass poisonings, on uh, what's happened in the past. And uh, actually, the largest episode of intentional mass poisoning by arsenic happened shortly after World War II. And it was interesting because it was, the poisoning was carried out. Is this not loud enough? All right. The poisoning was, uh, was carried out by a, a group of Holo Jewish Holocaust survivors and uh, former partisans who uh, were in Europe after, uh, after World War II, and they wanted to uh, exact some revenge uh, against um, some of the Nazis. And, um, they knew that there was a large uh, prisoner of war camp in outside of Nuremberg that the Americans, it used to be run by the Germans for allied prisoners, but then after the Ger Germans lost, the Nazis lost the war, uh, it, they actually housed in particular at this camp uh, 14,000 to 15,000 members of the SS stormtroopers. So on the night of uh, April 13, 1946, three members of this underground uh, group of partisans um, broke into a bakery that was a few miles away that used to provide the uh, bread for the prisoner of war camp. And they particularly made a type of brown bread or black bread that was only eaten by the prisoners, uh, by the Germans. It wasn't, it wasn't eaten by the, um, the Americans who had their white bread, which the Germans wouldn't touch. So, then uh, what they did is they actually um, took, in, uh, a con they took in powdered arsenic and they had mixed it with some glue and water and they used some paintbrushes and wearing personal protective equipment, they actually pa uh, painted on the, the surfaces of the bread this arsenic containing solution. And, uh, and then the bread was picked up and delivered to the camp. Apparently they, there was some uh, logistic issues that they encountered and they, they, they couldn't use up all the arsenic. They bought in seven bottles of arsenic, uh, uh, more than 10 kilograms, which is a lot of arsenic, um, because that's, um, you know, enough to kill thousands of people. Uh, but they, they weren't able to use it all. And this is a picture actually of the bakery. And the next day, and this was, we know about this from two sources. One is that there were newspaper accounts of it at the time. There was actually an article about it in the New York Times. But there was also um, the people who, 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 the partisans who carried this out actually escaped. They left right afterwards. And they went to Israel, to Palestine at the time. And uh, some of them were alive uh, as long, well, some of them are still alive. And then in the 19, late 1990s, they actually told the whole story about what happened, and some of these, this is how we know some of the details. But the next day, uh, over um, 2,000 of the inmates were sickened with the acute onset of vomiting, watery diarrhea, and skin rashes, and about 10% were hospitalized, but no one died. And it was considered a mystery for a long time. With all this arsenic, why didn't anyone die? But the, recently, uh, the 
the, the secret U.S. Army files were obtained by Freedom of Information Act request, and they showed that the analysis of the bread showed it had about 200 milligrams of arsenic, and a, a soldier would, uh, a, a prisoner would get about a fourth of a loaf, and 50 milligrams is enough to give you nausea and vomiting diarrhea, but it's not enough to kill you. And, that, and, and so it wasn't, uh, it turned out to be a mass poisoning, but there were no lethalities. Well, that's a nice historical note, and uh, it shows that inorganic arsenic has been used uh, for an agent of mass poisoning. But most of the time when we encounter situations of people being poisoned by arsenic, it's not on a mass level, but it's on people who are deliberately trying to target someone else or poison somebody else. Uh, 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 business associate, uh, uh, a spouse, something else. And here's a case that actually Ivy came consult, I was consulted on many uh, years ago uh, when I was in UC, UCSF, and it's a really uh, classic and yet uh, very colorful case of um, a woman who was poisoned, uh, and at first it wasn't at all clear what it was due to. So it was a 39-year-old woman who was an accountant, and she presented to the emergency department, and she had some nausea and vomiting and diarrhea for a few days. Uh, her laboratory test was really unremarkable, except for a little low potassium, which might have gone along with um, some of the diarrhea. And they basically thought she just had a viral gastroenteritis. They gave her some IV fluids, uh, and they sent her home. And an antiemetic, and they sent her home, and you'll do fine. But she returned the next day. She wasn't better. And they examined her again, and this time she looked a little dehydrated. She had some postural tachycardia. They did some basic labs, and uh, they noticed she had a slightly elevated bilirubin and slightly elevated liver transaminases. So they still thought the diagnosis was viral gastroenteritis. She wasn't taking enough fluids in, so they admitted her for hydration. Uh, the house staff actually thought it was a really uninteresting case, and uh, why are you admitting this person with viral gastroenteritis? But they took her in. Now, during the first three hospital days, uh, she didn't really continue to get that better. Uh, she continued to complain of crampy abdominal pain. Uh, she developed some uh, perioral and, and pedal edema. Uh, but she became uh, progressively, when they were following CBC, she became progressively anemic. Her white count is shown there, 4.9. It wasn't elevated. It wasn't, didn't look like an infection very much. She wasn't febrile. Uh, they did a stool for oven parasites. That was negative. They called in a GI consultant. Why is this person who has viral gastroenteritis still sick after uh, three days in the hospital? And he says, well, you know, she has elevated LFT. She probably has some hepatitis, some viral suppression of, uh, of her white count. And uh, that's, the, that's the situation. But so she remained in the hospital, but her next a uh, few days, her course was really became dramatically different. She was walking down the hall, she became lightheaded, and uh, they had to lie her down, and they did an EKG, and she had supraventricular tachycardia. They brought her into the coronary care unit, and the next few days, she had several runs of non-sustained uh, VTAC, and actually uh, developed torsade de pointe, which some of you may know is a uh, a uh, unusual and uh, sometimes very life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia, which uh, they were able to control. Uh, her chest X-ray showed she had some slight cardiomegaly and, and, and um, pure effusions. Uh, her GI complaints resolved by the second week in the hospital. Um, her LFTs, you know, maxed out around 500, which isn't that that high. But then she developed a slowly progressive uh, depression of her red cell count and her white cell count. In fact, her uh, white count got down to 1.1, and her hematocrit was down to tw uh, 22. So they called in a hematologist to look at her, and the hematologist, what do they do? They do bone marrow biopsy. So they took her bone marrow, and they basically said, well, she's got some erythroid hyperplasia, Cariohexis, it looks like a nonspecific response to an insult, which wasn't very helpful. Uh, the, the peripheral smear showed some basophilic stippling, which is interesting, and some reticulocytosis, but they still didn't know what was causing this. So she had multiple different consultants, and an, it, almost every consultant you could think of. Neuro was in looking at it, they didn't know. Cardiology said, well, wow, this is unusual. She's got uh, all these different systemic complaints. Maybe she has cardiac lupus, 
you know, you don't see that very often, but uh, that wasn't the case. They, they brought in an ophthalmologist to look at her eyes for Kaiser Flacher rings, which are associated with Wilson's disease, and that was negative. Um, finally, the, the initial gastrointestinal consultant, GI consultant, returned. He says, why don't we do a heavy metal screen? And so they measured a blood arsenic. They sent it out. It took a few days to come back on day 11. It came back 160 micrograms per liter, which is very high. That normally you know, would be something that would be uh, less than one. And uh, they repeated it um, again, and it was three a few days later, which is interesting because the blood arsenic drops, dropped very quickly. Um, actually, three would have been within the normal range of the laboratory. I said let, normally less than one. You could say the, the normal range is, like, is, is less than um, five. But the 24-hour urine that they did was markedly elevated. It contained several thousand micrograms of arsenic. So they realized this woman has arsenic poisoning. And at that point, they called the Poison Control Center in San Francisco, where I was affiliated, and I came in and saw the patient. And they had started her a little bit on, an, on, a, on a chelator BAL, which we'll talk about later. But at this point, the, she had already been ill for um, you know, more than two weeks. And so the chelation was not going to be very helpful. But look at what continued to happen to this lady. She developed palmar desquamation on day 23. And I knew that this woman is going to develop a peripheral neuropathy. I didn't know how severe, but I knew she was going to develop it. So I came in every day and was examining her. And then uh, on day 29, she had no peripheral neuropathy. And on day 30, she started complaining of, that the bed sheets were burning her feet. She developed hyperpathia to, to it. And then she went on to develop weakness. And the weakness extended um, distally to proximally and eventually involved the pros, pros, proximal muscles of her chest that she couldn't even breathe, and she had to be put on a ventilator. And she was um, ventilated, and uh, she had autonomic instability as well. Um, and, and they thought she was going to die. And I said, no. I said, you know, if you just do supportive care, this, she should recover a bit. And she did. And by day 62, her muscle strength began to return, and by day 73, she could be successfully weaned from the ventilator. Uh, she re had a return of gross voluntary limb movement on day 83, and by six months after the uh, incident, she had recovered most of her motor strength to the point where she was able to walk, but she had some uh, residual weakness in her toes. And um, the source, the police were involved, the source of the poisoning was investigated. They never found it. They, they certainly suspected foul play. They thought maybe some friends had uh, wanted to inherit some of her money, uh, but they never found out who it was. But this is really a very classic case of arsenic. And one of the key things to, to remember about heavy metal poisoning, and arsenic in particular, is that they interfere with enzyme function and cell signaling and gene expression that, is, that are common to cells and organs throughout the body. So the hallmark of arsenic poisoning, and, uh, and many heavy, heavy metal poisonings for that matter, is um, successive phases of multisystemic dysfunction. So uh, if you, many of you will probably never become tox, clinical toxicologists, but uh, you may be in the situation in the hospital taking care of some of these patients that have these multi-systemic complaints. And if someone has multi-systemic complaints like this, think of possibility of heavy metal poisoning and, uh, and, and test for it. So, you know, it, in arsenic, in the case of inorganic arsenic, we have, you know, multi-phases. The initial phase, which is within hours, the classic finding is what this lady had, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and some abdominal pain. Uh, and people also can have hypotension. And in severe cases, they can develop shock. Um, they develop meta metabolic acidosis. Is an uh, elevated positive anion gap metabolic acidosis is also fairly classic um, early on. Neurological symptoms are all over the map. You can have people who are agitated. You can have people who are uh, somnolent. And you can have people with no change in uh, mental status. Then you have a phase two, and sometimes the GI complaints are getting better, but then, like this woman had on day seven, she developed these cardiac arrhythmias, and you can get prolonged QT interval, which is very common, and that can lead to 
uh, cardiac arrhythmias like supraventricular tachycardia or torsade de point. You can develop congestive, cardi uh, congestive heart failure and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema as well. And then you can also develop the hepatic elevations and transaminases like we showed. Uh, and sometimes you can develop uh, um, dermatologic findings, including a macular papular rash, which they saw in those German prisoners. She, this woman did not have that, um, or desquamation or periorbital edema. And then you get this phase three, which is one to four weeks later, where you develop the pancytopenia, and you'll see a depression in the white count and the red count and the platelet count. And you can get this sensory motor peripheral neuropathy. So it involves uh, sensation, sensory, it starts off stocking glove. The classic finding is that people complain of the bed sheets burning because they're very sensitive. And then they develop progressive um, uh, weakness. Uh, sometimes you see dermatologically something called Mies lines. They'll also be called Aldrich Mies lines. You don't see them right away. But like a month or two later, you'll see a white streak across the nail bed. And that is due to the fact that at the peak of the poisoning, there was an interference in the, keratiz the, the keratization front of the uh, nails being formed. And, uh, and that will show up later as a, as a, um, as a uh, form of Mies lines. And some people also get herpes zoster because arsenic can suppress the immune system. The differential diagnosis is pretty broad. Most of the time, people think of, of uh, gas, you know, they consider it a gastroenteritis, because you know, typically if someone come, and if, someone, if people get poisoned by something being in their food, and a bunch of them get sick, what do you think? Well, they all got food poisoning. You know? So they think of a bacterial or a viral gastroenteritis, um, or staphylococcal uh, enterotoxin. But some other things to think about are salicylates, which can have multisystemic uh, involvement, and can also cause metabolic acidosis. Iron poisoning, iron, you know, supplemental iron that you take in, in maternal vitamins or prenatal vitamins, that can cause multisystemic effects. Thallium is a heavy metal that can look some, somewhat similar. Colchicine is an anti-inflammatory drug which also causes multisystemic effects. And very rarely, you may only see one or two cases in your career, is something called acute intermittent porphyria, which people can have both hematologic, neurologic, and abdominal complaints. Uh, now, the, the way you confirm arsenic poisoning is to do a urine test that's positive uh, for arsenic. Um, and you, the best thing to do is to, arsenic is, is, appears in the urine both as inorganic arsenic and then two of the main metabolites, because the body methylates arsenic. So you, the first step in the methylation is something called MMA, or monomethyl arsenic, and the second step is dimethyl arsenic, DMA. And so you can see all three of those in the urine after a person has been exposed to inorganic arsenic. But there's a non-toxic form of arsenic that's found in seafood. And this form, the arsenic is, doesn't have three carbons around it, it has four carbons around it. And it's, it's totally non-toxic. And you can have thousands of elevated levels of total arsenic in your urine after you've had like a lobster meal or, or seafood. In fact, one time I got called in to see a patient that wound up having Guillain-Barre syndrome and they did a, a total arsenic level on the patient and it, the arsenic level was very high. So they said, oh, this little person has arsenic poisoning because you know, Guillain-Barre is the motor, you know, motor uh, paralysis. Uh, and I looked at the patient and I said, no, there were no sensory symptoms. There were no hematologic symptoms. This doesn't fit. And I, I, I knew how to make the diagnosis. I said, do you have the menu of the patients at the hospital the night before? And they went to the dietician. What do you want to see the menu? And the patient had, had fish sticks the night before. And so they had elevated total urine arsenic, but it wasn't the, the, the toxic kind. Uh, blood is not a good, uh, is not a good test uh, in general because arsenic disappears from the blood very quickly. You noticed how it was 16 on one day 160 on one day in this case it just presented, and it got flagged as abnormal. But two days later, it w they repeated it, and it was three. If they had waited two more days to do the test, it would have come back normal. They would have written off arsenic, and they would never have diagnosed what was wrong with this lady, ever. So the best way to do it is to do this urine test. Now, what about 
another form of arsenic poisoning that isn't as an acute poisoning, but yet you might be hearing about somewhat in the hospitals today, and that is our, uh, uh, complications that arise from the therapeutic use of arsenic. How many people, by show of hands, knew that arsenic is used uh, as a chemotherapy to treat uh, um, a couple of hands? It's used now to treat uh, a, a promyelocytic leukemia, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Uh, and that's a long story in and of itself, but um, it does actually work uh, in this one type of, uh, of uh, bad uh, leukemia and, and, and it achieves very good remissions. You have to give the individual a fair amount of arsenic, about anywhere from 0.1 to 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per day for up to one to two months. So that's anywhere from like seven to 18 milligrams a day IV. And some of the people, um, become ill with this. And here's like an example of a guy who had acute uh, myelocytic leukemia, and they were um, thinking that, um, that actually maybe arsenic would help him, so uh, they, they started treating him with, with, uh, with arsenic at a dose of 20 milligrams per day, and uh, he developed a, um, a drug, um, a drug-related uh, sensory peripheral neuropathy, and on day 42, he had to get intubated, and they thought that was due to progressive leukemia. But then he started developing uh, runs of ventricular tachycardia. So they treated that, and they got it under uh, control, and his repeat EKG was normal, but then the next few hours he developed this. And people recognize this as torsade de point. You know, it's called turning of the points. And you notice that it has this very characteristic thing where here the most of it's going up, then it goes down, then it goes up, and uh, this they could not uh, resuscitate him from, and he died. The package insert for um, Trisonox, which is the brand name for arsenic trioxide, does now carry a, block, a black box warning saying that you have to be worried about QT uh, prolongation on the EKG, and that you need to monitor um, the uh, the EKG, and uh, the decision whether to continue uh, treatment after um, the QTC interval is more than um, 500 milliseconds is a, is a risk-benefit analysis. And, um, you know, but, but there's a saying in medicine, uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. And uh, if you're having relapsed uh, leukemia, uh, you might take the chance. <laughs> because, uh, you, you know, the arsenic has a chance of uh, saving you. But, in fact, as a general rule, I'm a toxicologist and I deal with arsenic a lot, uh, which is not very common in, um, in the United States, that I never get consulted by the oncologists. They think your our drugs are all toxic. <laughs> they, they never, you know, they, they, they never, uh, they never have to figure that they, we need a toxicologist. The uh, etiology of the arsenic-induced uh, QT prolongation has actually been the subject of um, some investigation. It seems to be that arsenic actually um, upregulates some specific types of mRNA, and this mRNA then suppresses the expression of certain gene products that are involved in the uh, control of um, the potassium circuits on myocytes, the, the potassium channels on myocytes. And, um, and that may be involved with uh, affecting uh, cardiac repolarization, and that causes the prolonged Q QT interval. Besides uh, cardiac toxicity, you can get some other effects like the uh, uh, the differentiation syndrome that is associated with actually the first steps in, in, in uh, treating acute promyelocytic leukemia. You can get the sensory motor peripheral neuropathy. Some patients become encephalopathic, actually. And it's interesting, they become encephalopathic, and most of the time when they do that, they also have thiamine deficiency. And you know how thiamine deficiency, we see it in in alcoholics sometimes, Wernicke's encephalopathy, and you treat them with thiamine. Turns out that um, thiamine is important in the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, right? In, 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 in metabolism of pyruvate. And arsenic targets that enzyme too, 
So it's a double whammy if you're, if you're thiamine deficient and, and you have arsenic exposure, and that can set you up for a, a Wernicke's encephalopathy. Now let's change to a different form of arsenic and a different story, again, that was not at first recognized uh, by the hospital. Uh, and by the doctors who, who took care of the patient. This was a 55-year-old gentleman who came to the emergency department, and he complained of sharp back pain that wouldn't go away. It was radiating not only to his groin, but it was radiating to the legs and to his shoulders. So it was bad back pain. And he stayed at home with this back pain uh, for a while, and then he went to the bathroom, and he noticed he was passing bright red urine. So he said, I better go into the hospital. So he came into the emergency department, on physical exam, uh, you see the vitals here were not very remarkable, a little bit hypertensive. His physical exam uh, uh, by examination was remarkable only you know, for the fact that he had bright red urine. They did a urinalysis. He had some clumps of white cells and some mild hematuria. His creatinine was normal, but his white count was very high, 30, 36,000 with 70% bands. So they said, well, this guy may, may have uh, an infection, a bacterial infection. So they started working him up. They sent him into the CT scan to look at um, his kidneys, and um, he became hypotensive, required IV fluids, and some norepinephrine to increase his blood pressure. So they said, this guy is going into septic shock. So they started him on antibiotics, and they admitted him to the um, intensive care unit. Uh, during the night, he became increasingly uh, short of breath, he started to develop uh, a pattern on his chest x-ray that looked like ARDS. And then his skin had an interesting color. It, it, he was a white man, It eventually his skin became what they called beet red. And his urine became black. It started out of red, it became black. Uh, and his hemoglobin dropped to 8.8, .8, and his creatinine went up to 2.6. So they said, this is an unusual case, what's going on? And uh, they, we, we, you know, they said, well, we need more history. We had to talk to this guy. They had never asked him what he does for a living, what happened. So they said, let's, let's ask him a little bit about what was going on. So they asked him in a history, and I do occupational medicine. I encourage you to get, just even if it's in passing, ask all your patients, say, uh, what do you do for a living? Do you work with any chemicals? Do you have any hobbies that involve you? Just, it sometimes makes for a rapport with your patient, but you may pick up something interesting at some point. So just as an aside, I want you to do that. So in this case, they asked this guy, you know, well, what do you, what do, you do? He said, well, I work for a water treatment company, and I, I was uh, assigned the task of decontaminating some water that contained arsenic, and to do that, I was supposed to pour acid into it to, to uh, neutralize it. You don't, not supposed to do that. <laughs> and because what happened is that uh, while he was pouring the acid into that, he had this garlic smell that he, they picked up, and he was forming this gas called arsine gas, which is ar arsenic trihydride. And it turned out, while they were getting that history, two of his coworkers who were standing next to him when he was doing this, they came in because they started uh, having bright red urine. Just, they didn't get high, as highly exposed. It took a little longer for it to show up. So they started the patient on a, a chelating agent, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, BAL. And then they switched into an oral one, DMSA. But the main thing that they did, which uh, they should have done right away, but they didn't get, make the diagnosis, was exchange transfusion. Exchange transfusion is a treatment where you basically take all the person's blood out and you put it in, you put in new donor blood. And you can actually hook up takes a lot of blood, so you got to plan ahead of time. This guy required uh, 17 units. Um, you, these people develop renal failure as well because what happens when you cause severe hemolysis, which arsenic uh, does? You have hemoglobin elevated in the plasma, you know, cell-free hemoglobin, and then that precipitates in the renal tubules, and it causes what's called uh, hemoglobinopathy, uh, or I shouldn't call it that, it causes um, hemoglobin deposition in the kidneys, then, and then you get uh, uh, acute tubular necrosis. And this guy actually required uh, hemodialysis for months before his kidney function recovered, his oxygen function recovered as well. And sure enough, he had elevated arsenic, and, uh, and uh, this was, um, uh, in retrospect, a classic case of arsine gas. Uh, 
Arsene gas is very, known to be a very toxic gas, and it's only used in a few industrial applications in the semiconductor industry. Uh, and it can, most of the time, though, we don't see, they're aware of the fact that it's very dangerous and they take a lot of precautions. But it's in other situations where arsenic might be present in like uh, um, some waste products. And then they, I, there was even a case one time where, where there was some metal a metal ladder that contained some arsenic alloy in it, or trace amounts of arsenic, and it was placed in the ground where there was a leak and there was acid in the ground, and the reaction of the acid with the metal uh, on, in the alloy caused arsenic mm -hmm. release. So uh, it's, uh, it's something to keep in mind of. Um, again, it has multi-systemic signs and symptoms, many you know, of which were described in, uh, in these patients, you know, involving all these different symptoms. Again, a classic thing for thinking about heavy metals. You should strongly suspect arsine poisoning in a patient who has some initial constitutional complaints of malaise, maybe backache, some GI disturbance, and then within hours passes bright red blood. Okay, and it's not that there's a lot of cells. Notice this patient did not have a lot of cells in his urine. Okay, so if you get back that the dipstick, the urine dipstick says um, high, high heme, four plus heme, but when you look in the cells, there's only like six red blood cells. What does that tell you? Patient has had hemolysis because you're seeing the hemoglobin being, you know, cell-free. So that's the clue that the person has hemolysis, that, that kind of finding. And the, the skin discoloration is due to the hemoglobin or the hemoglobin products, which have, you know, hemoglobin is bright red. So the hemoglobin products of arsine that get distributed give you this like reddish or bronzes discoloration to the skin. It's, it's sometimes called jaundice, but it's not jaundice. And this exchange transfusion, not dialysis, but exchange transfusion is important because dialysis doesn't remove this heme, uh, this, this combination of heme and the arsenic that uh, are seen that causes the hemolysis. You actually have to get it out of the body, and it's a, it's a large molecule because hemoglobin's big, and you can't get it out by dialysis. You have to actually do exchange transfusion, and that's indicated, uh, especially when the plasma hemoglobin gets above 1.5. And um, these, this is a differential, um, which, uh, you know, have people, you don't see much malaria around in, uh, in the United States, of course, but overseas, you know, it's sometimes called black water fever. Black water, like black water, black urine, because you got this severe hemolysis. And uh, 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 that can, um, that's another in the differential of arsine poisoning. But uh, you probably won't see much malaria uh, in, in Birmingham. Now, last but not least, let's talk a little bit about uh, lewisite, which is the, has its own interesting history as a toxic warfare agent. And this is something that Dr. Athar has uh, been studying uh, and has looked at very much at the Center for Excellence here in our Senegals. And the history of it is interesting because it was developed, you know, during World War I, it was a war in which uh, they actually used a lot of war gases. They use chlorine. They use phosgene uh, in the, you know in the in the in the uh, trench warfare, and the 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 Americans said, well, we need to develop additional warfare agents that'll be uh, effective, and they put actually an army captain who was a chemist named uh, um, Winifred Lee. That's a picture of uh, the young Dr. Lee there, and they said, we want you to develop a chemical warfare agent. And it turns out that at, um, at, at, uh, at the institute there, one of the previous professors, uh, uh, Professor Newland, had actually uh, was looking at doing some experiments not related to warfare gas, and he he, a reaction went wrong, and he became very ill himself for a while, and they figured out that there was something that in this reaction that was a bad gas. They, they went back and said, why don't you figure out what's in that? You know, can you imagine trying to develop a chemical warfare gas, and you look back, someone said, well, you know, I was doing a chemistry experiment, so almost killed me <laughs> from this gas. And let's check that out. It might be good to use. And that's what they, they did, and he came up with this. It's, it, this is the structure that's shown here. It's, it's, a, uh, um, it's called dichloral 
di uh, two chloral vinyl are seen. And um, in fact, the United States developed it as a, as a warfare gas, and they were shipping it over to Europe to potentially use in World War I, and on the way, the armistice was signed, the war ended, and they had a boatload of these canisters. They just dumped them in the North Sea, and, the, and they're still down there. <laughs> now, this, this was, uh, these are actually uh, at the, at the uh, American University in, uh, um, uh, in Spring Valley, uh, Maryland, um, when they finished this work on these warfare agents back in the 20s, they basically knocked down the building and they dumped, the, you know, they buried a lot of the equipment and everything in the ground. And then like 70 years later, they were doing some construction and they dug it up and some people <laughs> found these uh, cylinders and there was all sorts of concern about it. So, uh, but, but to my knowledge, no one got seriously poisoned uh, when, they did the, when they discovered it. Now, lewisite was done, the focus of some studies after World War II, um, I mean, excuse me, after World War I, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but fortunately, this agent was never used in the battlefield. Uh, in fact, this is a quote from the Institute of Medicine report. It said, field experiences indicate that dosages sufficiently large enough to to impact the military operations are probably not attainable with any reasonable expender of munitions. You couldn't get a large enough concentration in the field. And one of the reasons you couldn't is that it, it's hydrolyzed pretty quickly to an, in, to an insoluble, non-volatile form. So it was never really, they fought mustard gas, uh, which is something that Dr. Arthur is also interested in studying at, at the center here, was much more effective. And in fact, even though Lewisite was in the armamentarium of the United States and the Nazis during World War II, neither side used it. And um, it still remained in the, in the uh, chemical warfare. You know, the United States didn't really abandon, officially abandon the, the potential use of chemical warfare until the Nixon administration in 1972. And then, you know, after the end of the Cold War, a lot of these stocks have been destroyed. But there's still, you know, been concern about the use of mustard uh, in the Middle East. And there was some evidence that it was used uh, by Saddam Hussein. Now, exposure to lewisite vapor produces, uh, or liquid produces, an, almost an immediate irritation uh, and burning of the eyes, the upper respiratory tract, and the lungs. And it can cause a little bit of a delay of some severe blistering and if you get enough of it in, you can actually get enough pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema, and you can die quickly, okay? But it doesn't kill you immediately. The thing is, that was considered one of the attributes of it as a chemical warfare agent, because if you're in a battle and your compatriots die immediately, you kind of leave them there while you're continuing the fight. But if you have a compatriot who's injured, it usually takes two healthy soldiers to then retreat and take that that, that injured person out of battle. So it's actually the fact that this caused people to be blind and have difficulty breathing was considered, but not kill them right away, was considered to be, you know, it, it's, it's more, it's macabre, but it, it was considered to be, that was a good factor about it. Um, but they did a study on this, you know, when it first came out. Now we wouldn't do these kind of studies today, but they actually asked for volunteers at the Edwidge Arsenal in the 1920s to see how it would work on people. And um, they, they actually got 53, 52 men to volunteer to have a single drop, a tenth of a cc, placed on their forearm. And uh, this is some of the findings on that study as, as uh, cited by the National Research Council in a report that they did in 2013. So in less than two point Five, two and a half minutes, you get a, a stinging sensation. That seems to go away at first, and it comes back in, in two hours. Uh, then you get some, in terms of the, how the skin looks, it, it, it starts to blanch or gray uh, within the first 15 to 30 minutes. And then about up to 12 hours later, you start getting a, a vesicle uh, forming with edema around it. And then by 24 hours, this, there's a surrounding area of redness and a larger central blister, and then satellite blisters. You can get hundreds of satellite blisters. Um, this is a picture of someone's forearm, and I think I believe this picture was taken from uh, these experiments. 
and this was a single drop. Look at that big blister there. That, it's not very nice. Um, and you know, the, these, these blisters can get up to uh, you know, six by three and a half inches. The pain becomes maximal on day six. Then it resolves. The skin eventually will heal. Uh, and you have some uh, sensitivity after that. Apparently, there is a report in, the, um, in some of the government studies that are based on secondary source summary documents that said that they must have exposed some human volunteers to inhalation. Look what they said. Inhalation of lewisite at 10 milligrams per cubic meter for 30 minutes reportedly resulted in severe intoxication and incapacitation that lasted for several weeks. And exposure at 10 milligrams per cubic meter for 15 minutes caused inflammation of the eyes and swelling of the eyelids. And no further details were provided. That document never made it, re got released. And uh, I don't know where that exists, but can you imagine that there were humans they actually exposed to that? This is, probably was done in the 20s. This is some data um, that was used to set what's called an acute exposure guideline level. And this is um, the concentration on this axis. You don't have to read, you can't read this. And this is time in minutes on the x-axis. And the main thing is these are animal studies. These are like severe poisoning and death. These are uh, other effects. And what they do is the government has, for, for hundreds of chemicals, and I encourage you if you ever get the question about this, there's, look up the eagles. They're called AEGLs on the internet and you'll get to a website and it basically tells you concentrations that are life-threatening of any of a given chemical after 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, a um, couple of hours, four hours, eight hours, and then they have a next level called Eagle 2 which isn't life-threatening but which is also um, hazardous and, and you notice they set the levels well below the ones that in animals cause overt effects. Now against that background let's go back to Britain. Right during the war, you know, London was being bombed and, you know, the, during the Blitz. And the British were very concerned. What if they start lobbing lewisite? You know, or they, they, they bomb, they put it in the subway where everyone went down in the shelters and they, they put lewisite bombs in there. They were really worried. They said, they asked the, uh, Dr. Peters and his colleagues at the Department of Biochemistry at Oxford University, they said, you have to develop an antidote to this stuff. So, they did some work and, they, and they, uh, they, they did a lot of basic science and they realized that the effect of arsenic seemed to be interacting with vicinal or, or, or adjacent thiol groups, SH groups, on proteins or on protein cofactors. And it, it bound, the arsenic bound to these group, two groups and formed a ring, they felt, and that this tied up and interfered with the action of the enzyme. And it particularly, they felt, interfered with pyruvate dehydrogenase. So they said, maybe we can develop an antidote that contains thiol groups that would compete for the arsenic with the tissue groups, with the tissue thiols, and would, would therefore be effective if it was given promptly. And they screened numerous compounds monothiles and dithiles and different size compounds and they came up with this uh, chemical here which is a dithiol which they said would scavenge or bind the arsenic and prevent it from effect, you know, reacting with thiol groups in essential enzymes like the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. And they did some studies which we'll talk about in a moment and it seemed to work. And they called it um, dimercoprol but the Americans and they shared this information with the Americans who were um, at Edgewood Arsenal and Aberdeen Proving Grounds who were doing research. And uh, the Americans called it British anti lewisite And so that's literally what it's still called today, or BAL for abbreviation. Um, one of the things that uh, Peter's group, Peter Stockton and Thompson, found, for example, is that um, if you just gave lewisite to a preparation of, uh, of skin tissue and you added pyruvate and you looked at how oxygen, you know, the, oxy, oxy, the, the metabolism of pyruvate is part of aerobic metabolism. It involves oxygen. So um, normally uh, you, you would have um, uh, a decline in the use of oxygen if you were impairing that enzyme. And so when you added 
uh, lewisite and you didn't use any treatment, you had a 50% decline in the, in the way the tissue could utilize oxygen. If you used a monothiol to in, added to the solution, you, you didn't have any effect. You still had a decline. Uh, but if you used BAL, you only had a 6% decline. So I said, yeah, this is really uh, helping um, prevent this enzyme uh, inhibition. And then they said, well, let's actually look at um, doing some tests in animals. And so they found that um, if they treated uh, rats, they, they, were, they, they treated rats with some, on their skin with lewisite. And if they just um, treated the animals with the lewisite, no, 20, out of 27 animals, none of them survived. When they used a monothiol, like mercaptoethanol, none of them survived. But when they added BAL, 30 minutes after they added the lewisite, look at that, 21 out of 21 survived. Now, you don't have to be a statistician to look at that and say, this is an antidote, <laughs> right? It's working, it's helping, and survive. So they started uh, developing it uh, as a stocked antidote, and um, they were ready to use it in, during the war. And it turned out that it, they never had to use it during the war uh, on the battlefield for soldiers, because I mentioned to you, lewisite was never used. But there was a situation where the people who were making the lewisite bombs in the United States and England had some industrial accidents and they used the, the BAL to treat them. And this is one of the only case reports I think has ever been published on the toxicity of lewisite, significant toxicity in a human. It was published in what's called the gray literature, uh, the, U, the bulletin of the US Army Medical Department. If you go on Medline, you will not find this. But uh, I was able to locate it through some other sources. And this was uh, basically a, um, a worker at the Pine Bluff Arsenal in Arkansas during the war who was involved in making lewisite bombs for the United States. He was sprayed with uh, a lewisite on his legs, about 20 to 25% body surface area. And they uh, decontaminated him, uh, which they described elsewhere in the article as uh, removing his clothing, irrigating it, and putting some topical BAL on. And then they took him to the hospital. And when he got at the hospital, he had normal vital signs, but with, you notice within two hours, he started to develop hypotension uh, and, and uh, tachycardia, despite receiving a lot of fluid resuscitation. And in fact, he required um, a lot of, back then they just gave, instead of just giving normal saline, they gave him a lot of plasma. I mean, this guy had like a severe burns. And you notice uh, back here, let's back up for a second. Look at the vesiculation that develop and the weeping, you know. So this is like a chemical burn, a third degree burn. People require a tremendous amount of fluid, and this guy did too. Uh, he, he received something called escatin, which, you know, what is that? Uh, if you go back in the literature, that was something before they had um, glucocorticoids. They just took the adrenal glands of cows and made extracts, which they knew, we now know today, had, had glucocorticoid in it. Uh, and they gave him some morphine. And uh, then they noticed he became uh, what they called a ra rather severe anemia, which is consistent, uh, too, with a systemic effect uh, of uh, arsenic. And uh, he required some blood transfusions. Uh, over the, over the, and he was eventually skin grafted on day 32. This is a picture of him uh, 42 days later. And that, they actually, you know, it's not a great picture, but they actually thought he had pretty good results. But this is the only case I've ever been able to find. I don't know, Dr. Athar, have you ever heard of a, a case report of this? I saw this. Pictures. Oh, you saw these pictures? Okay. Well, we'll have to talk further afterwards. But, um, now, there was another, they, this, these were very rare cases of lewisite. But you know what was one of the most significant arsenic poisonings that, they found, that people encountered around mid, mid last century? It was the side effects of arsenic antibiotics. How many people were here and realized that the first antibiotic ever developed was an, arsen an arsenic-based drug? There's someone right there. By Paul Ehrlich, 1906, Salvarsan. And arsenic-based drugs were the first antibiotics. And they were used particularly to treat syphilis. And when uh, they, wor they worked, they weren't great. They weren't as good as penicillin that came around, you know, in the mid-century, but 
they used it a lot, and people developed a lot of skin reactions and reactions. And after BAL became available, people thought, well, maybe this would be good to treat the skin reactions that occur in some of the patients who were receiving arsenical drugs for syphilis. And there was actually a series of cases in which it, they started treating these patients. This was a woman who had um, one month after she, uh, she received seven weeks of treatment with an arsenic-containing drug called arsphenamine for syphilis. And it, it cured her syphilis, but she had this terrible weeping skin rash. And so they gave her BAL, a six-day course, and she had pretty good improvement. And they, there's an article, this article that was by Carlton and uh, published after the war in 1948, talks about 30 cases of people. And they say, like, typically patients took 62 days for their skin to clear. Uh, they cut that down by about a third, I mean, by two thirds when they started using BAL. Uh, they also showed that uh, when they gave the uh, BAL to these patients, the urine arsenic excretion went up, consistent with the drug chelating or binding the arsenic and then excreting it in the urine. Uh, and so actually BAL, after World War II, became the mainstay of treatment for arsenic poisoning in the United States, uh, basically for um, the next 45 years. In fact, it's still on the uh, formulary of a lot of hospitals. Uh, it's not a pleasant drug to, to, to use, however. First of all, it smells terrible. It's a mercaptan. It smells skunk-like. Two, up to two-thirds of the patients who get it get ill. They have nausea and vomiting. They can develop high blood pressure. They can develop uh, uh, even a lot of pain at the injection site. And, um, and it, it's dissolved in peanut oil. That was the way they initially made it. So when it got approved, they, could, they had to keep it in the same preparation that they used to approve it. They couldn't just change it. And so like, people allergic to peanuts cannot get this, this drug. Um, and, uh, but, but this was what they used in the United States. It's interesting, historically, that in the Soviet Union and in China, they developed two different types of alternatives to BAL that were water-soluble. And one of them is shown here. This is called DMSA, or dimer succinic acid. And you notice it has two vicinal thiol groups. And this one is called DMPS, dimer propane sulfonic acid. Uh, and this was developed in the Soviet Union. And both these drugs have the advantage is that they don't have to be given by intramuscular injection. They can be given intravenously. They are much safer. They don't have that pattern of side effects. And what's the advantage of, of using, if you have someone who's arsenic poisoning, what happens? They're in shock. They're no, they have nausea and vomiting. Uh, that's not the best, you know, you want to deliver a large amount of a drug quickly. And if you, if you put it in the muscle, like you put it in the buttocks, you, didn't, you need good blood pressure to perfuse your buttocks to get the drug out. You want to be able to put this in a central line and get it to people quickly, so you want an IV preparation. And it turns out that these, are, these drugs, which developed in the Soviet Union and in China, communist China, uh, were much better than BAL, but they published them in Russian, and Chinese, and you know, there was the Cold War, and people didn't really believe that the Russians or the Chinese had good drugs, and, no one, and they, they were never developed in the United States. West Germany actually decided to make the drug, and there was a German company that started making it, uh, in, and became, it's still a prescription drug in Germany today, DMPS, but it's not available in the United States for marketing, only by compounding pharmacists. But look at the comparing, this is the, um, Therapeutic index, which is uh, the LD50 of the drug divided by the dose, the ED50, which is the dose that prevents arsenic lethality in 50% of the exposed animals. So if the LD50 of a drug, which is the amount that it takes to be toxic, is much, much greater than the amount that, that is uh, required to be effective, that's called a big therapeutic index. The therapeutic index of DMSA is 369 of DMPS is 119. For, for BAL, it's only 8.76. So you could tell that these drugs are, are much more effective. But, uh, you know, DMPS is, in fact, the best. This was a, a, a study in which they took a dose of arsenic, 
and they injected it subcutaneously in mice. 20 minutes later, they, took, they, they started taking groups of mice and um, sacrificing them, and taking out their kidneys and measuring the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme activity. If initially they, they dropped it to zero, and then they started giving different doses of DMSA or DMPS, and look at how much more, D, by, by um, a little over an hour after receiving several doses of DMPS, the animals had normal enzyme function, completely reversed the effects of arsenic. Okay. Really effective. This is, they were better than BAL, too. So these are better drugs. Why aren't they available in the United States if for intravenous use? DMPS, you can't, it, it should be in the formulary. You can get BAL, but you can't get DMPS. No one wants to spend the money, I think, a drug company to go get it formally approved. But that's a whole other story for another day. One of the other interesting things about um, DMPS is that it forms a direct chelate. It directly binds arsenic, but it doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't bind the inorganic arsenic. It binds the metabolite of inorganic arsenic, monomethyl arsenic acid. And in fact, this is a case report <coughs> that we published um, in abstract form and uh, presented at a meeting of a man who actually took uh, five grams of arsenic in a suicide attempt. <coughs> he, didn't, he didn't show up at the emergency department for five hours. And that's a little bit late. And that's a closing point. You've got to use these agents quickly. Because even though they started giving him BAL at first and then they switched him at this hospital, they happened to have DMPS, and they treated him with it, he still went on to die. But they analyzed his, um, his urine, and it turned out that he had a complex that they found of MMA3, which is actually the most toxic form of arsenic, bound to the DMPS, and it tied it all up. In fact, he had hardly any of dimethyl arsenic acid because it got all tied up by the, in, the, in the intermediate stage. So it's, it really is, you know, we're supposed to publish this, and it's on the to-do to -do list in a formal study, but it really is clear evidence that it forms a, a in vivo chelates. Now, the final points I want to, I, I know that we're, we're about over, but I want the final points I want to say is that yeah, if, you're gonna if we're going to develop effective countermeasures, we have to develop something that can be used quickly, okay? You, ha you can't wait hours, and you certainly can't wait till you get confirmation that you, know, you send out, well, this could be arsenic, and we're going to send out the lab, and then two days later you get back the test. Oh, there's arsenic present. If you're going to use a, a, a chelating agent or a countermeasure, you've got to be able to use it within minutes to a couple of hours. And so you won't have laboratory confirmation in most situations. You have to be able to, willing to go out on a limb and say, this looks like arsenic poisoning. Now, you may be wrong sometime. So if you're going to use a chelating agent or a, or, or a, a countermeasure, you want to have something that's relatively safe because you could be wrong, right? You have to use it empirically. So those are the two key necessities. Um, uh, for example, when they talked, they did some studies with bowel. If they gave a single dose of it to a lewisite or uh, organoarsenical uh, rabbit, um, within five minutes of exposure, all the rabbits lived. If they started giving multiple doses six hours later, none of them lived. Here's another study that was done looking at um, survival of mice after um, sodium arsenite. And again, if you, one hour, you have saved almost 80% uh, of the animals. If you waited to two hours, it dropped almost only half the animals. Here's a, a lewisite in the eye. These are rabbits. Uh, and this was done in the 1940s. This rabbit, um, both rabbit eyes got treated with lewisite uh, 24 hours earlier. And uh, this is, this rabbit, just got the lewisite. This rabbit, um, two minutes after the lewisite went on, they used a drop of BAL, one drop of BAL. So they gave one drop of lewisite, waited um, two minutes, and then gave the BAL. And that animal had a normal eye. The thing is, that's pretty quick. If you're in the battlefield or in a poisoning situation, you better have that stuff available pretty quickly. In fact, you know, after, if, if you delayed it till 10 minutes, there was still some permanent damage. Or, or persistent damage. 
So it shows the importance of, uh, of, of using these things quickly. And that's going to be the challenge for us as we develop countermeasures. We've got to develop something which is relatively safe as an antidote because we have to use it empirically sometimes. And we have to have it available portably that can be used in the field. And we have to have it um, something that we can, it's easy to use and that can be administered by like a first responder pretty quickly. So in summary, what have we talked about? We've talked about there's different types of arsenic that cause a different pattern of responses sometimes, but the, cl the classic thing is multi-systemic response. And that the countermeasures that develop, that are available, uh, can work, but we have to use them promptly, usually before we have definitive confirmation. Thanks very much for your attention.